Hello, and welcome to BCM 241 Media Ethnographies. This week, we're talking about digital ethnography, and I'm experimenting with a different format and trying a live-to-camera recording so that you get my floating head down here. So if I look over here, it's to check what you can see on the screen. Uh, this is all pretty new for me, so bear with me. So there may be some, some technical troubles and some cuts along the way um, as I edit after this, but I'm trying to experiment with different formats um, and different content presentation styles. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting your feedback about that. So leave a comment um, down below. Okay, so there's lots to get on with this week and let's get stuck into it. All right, firstly, let's think about what the digital means. What does the word actually mean? The digital is dialogical. That means it involves a communication exchange. That digital information is always uh, networked. It's always speaking to multiple connections. The digital implies one to many. Uh, and in fact, in, and in really, many to many. And so when we're talking about you know, digital information, digital ethnographies, we're really always implying networked connections. What's interesting about the digital is that it is not static. Um, and many people think of the digital as being kind of intangible in, and virtual, but at the core, the digital, um, in the way we know it at least, is electronic and it is therefore st uh, not static. It is not fixed. It is a signal. It is always in motion. Uh, there's, a, there's an old terminology that we used to refer to software in operation as running. And that's a really good um, way of thinking about the digital. It is always in movement. The digital is therefore always connected by processes to mechanical interpretation, right? The machine is actively interpreting the, the binary code of, of digital information and converting that into human um, readable content via visuals or, or text or whatever. So the digital is a process. It is in motion, it is static, and it is always being interpreted by machines for human interpretation. So there's multiple levels of interpretation that's always implicated in the digital. What we also know about the digital is that it is not persistent. It is malleable. It is malleable, it is changeable, and it is easy to overwrite. Now that on, on the surface seems pretty straightforward, but actually on mass, the digital can get quite complicated and it can be quite a, a complex means of deleting individual bits of information in a digital resource or a digital network or a digital library. I mean, yes, of course, you can always set off an EMP uh, and, and wipe everything, but to actually go into a system and to delete individual bits of information is quite difficult. So the notion of persistence when it comes to the digital is quite complex. So digital ethnography seeks to explore the consequences of these conditions of the digital. Digital ethnography seeks out and describes the cultures that are made possible or altered by the presence of digital technologies and practices. Remember, it's not just the thing itself, it's the cultural layer and the sociological layer of practices, organizations, institutions, communities, and networks, so on, that are um, brought into being or changed by the digital. And that's what digital ethnography is interested in. Digital ethnography uh, discloses, it investigates the experience of reality as it is transformed or mediated by the digital through both empirical observation and the application of theory to, that, to the results of that ob observation in order to come up with an explanation. So some important texts um, that there'll be examples uh, from these in the readings uh, on the Moodle page this week. 
um, this lovely book uh, by um, uh, Anna Pertiera, Media Anthropology for the Digital Age, uh, and this really useful text, uh, The Routledge Companion to Digital Ethnography, edited um, by Larissa Hajorth and others. And um, these are two really good resources for um, digital ethnography. And they're examples of how communication and media scholars have embraced anthropological theories and methods of ethnography to make sense of cultural formations occurring as participants have both adopted new media technologies, adapted them to their purposes, and adapted to them. And we'll be talking about the differences between those processes as we go through. However, I like this point that, that Pertiera makes, is that media ethnography makes use of ethnographic methods to study media without claiming to be doing anthropological work. Um, anthropologists can get a bit uppity if you um, are suggesting that you are doing anthropology without having that specific training. So what we're doing is we're appropriating the methods of ethnography as they have been developed out of anthropology for our own purposes. And those purposes for you are in order to, uh, I'm, you know, we're attempting in this course to make relevant to your future careers and jobs in the creative industries. So thinking about how digital ethnography is useful to you beyond simply doing research for a uni project. So in the next two parts of this lecture, I'm going to be drawing heavily on this book by um, Sarah Pink and others. And you can see all the, the, the names there. This is the, the book, uh, Digital Ethnography, Principles and Practice. And I'll be putting the first chapter on the Moodle page uh, for you to um, have a read. I really like this book. Um, 2016, um, it, which means it's, it's getting quite dated uh, now. Um, one thing about digital ethnography is that it moves at a tremendous pace, um, but it's still really relevant and can help you think about your media ethnography projects in a number of different ways and how you might be able to hone your data collection and think about the ways in which you can um, understand that data, that data and those observations through different analytical frameworks and theoretical paradigms, which I will touch on in this lecture today. So in the book, Pink et al. describe um, a kind of a set of principles for thinking about digital ethnographic research. And I'm going to kind of summarize that before we get into the specifics of the categories of digital ethnography that they propose. So the first idea is multiplicity. And I like this. This is very much what I was talking to you before about the definition of digital. Digital ethnographic research is always unique to the research question and the challenges to which it's responding. I really like this because this says that regardless of the methods for collecting data, regardless of the analytical temp, uh, you know, framework that you have or the theoretical paradigm that you're employing, what's really important is the central research question. Everything else comes after that. You have to figure out what you are trying to answer, what you are trying to find out, and that guides everything. And so there is no one set um, um, static fixed method for doing or methodology for doing digital ethnography. And an example of this would be researching social media. So if we were to research social media use in Australia, right, which might imply Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, that would be a very different research question with very different methods and very different analytical paradigms than a similar study researching social media use in China, right? Which, I don't understand. We are very thanks, different Thanks, Siri. Very different I, I appreciate your input, but you're going to have to be quiet. Okay. Sorry. Um, wasn't expecting that. So, <laughs> that threw me a little. Uh, where was I? So, yes, researching social media in China, which would not only mean different platforms and different access to that platforms and different technologies onto the platforms that you are accessing, 
accessing, but an entirely different range of sociological and cultural understandings that would inform that the, 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 the analysis going forward. So remember that digital ethnography is always guided by the research question and what you're trying to find out. Everything else follows that. This is a really important principle. The, the notion uh, of decentering the technology, right? In a digital ethnography, the technology is not always the focus. We'll talk about cases in a minute where, that, where it is specifically the focus, but it's, it's one among many elements that you have to consider. It's like I've been saying in your media ethnographies, we're not really interested in the text that you're examining. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in researching the experience of that text and figuring out what you can learn from that experience to help you make critical and interesting observations about it and gain new knowledge about it. So this involves decentering, you know, um, decentering the, the, the technology. And I've got a quote here from Pink. In order to understand how digital media are part of people's everyday worlds, we also need to understand the other aspects of their worlds and lives. In doing so, we might focus specifically on those domains of activity in which digital media are used rather than, rather than on the characteristics of the use of the media. We might focus specifically on the domains of activity. So it's not necessarily about the specific phone that you're using, but rather the whole range of context around which you are using that phone in that instance, at that time, in that location, in that way. Um, okay, an example. And a lot of these examples are actually going to be drawing from games, uh, you know, researching digital games because that's my background and I'm also teaching BCM 215 uh, game media industries. So there's a lot of overlap here uh, for students who are doing, doing both. Okay, so to understand the role of Fortnite in the lives of Australian children, I have, I have um, two young children play Fortnite amongst other games. Um, it's, a, it's a competition at the moment between Fortnite and Minecraft. So how, how would we go about decentering the technology well we could you know look at all the the popular media reports and all the all the kind of dramatic news stories about you know claims to addiction and media violence right maybe we could go in that direction or we could put that away and instead we could look at the way in which these children are forming networks we could look at the way in which they are talking to their friends sharing memes um, uh, consuming um, YouTube videos, watching Twitch streamers, producing TikTok videos. Um, early on, there was a lot of replication of the, the Fortnite dance emotes. Or maybe if you had, you know, uh, kind of permission, you could go and you know, observe how children talk about Fortnite uh, in the playground, right? So this is what we mean by decentering the technology. It no longer becomes... The, the, the only thing that we're thinking about, but rather uh, it becomes the reason to look at the, conte the context around the technology itself. Openness. This is um, a principle of digital ethnography proposed by Pink et al. As we said, the digital is non-static, always changing, being updated, increasing in speed and transforming. It is processual, and there is no fixed method for in investigating and understanding the digital. And so you have to be quite upfront and open about this, um, particularly when doing research for um, you know, a, a, a private organization, a business, a company. You can focus on a thing, but that thing may change very quickly. So you need to move from making observations about experience and, and, and creating that data and then using your theory and your analytical paradigm to make uh, to, to help you generate a broader understanding of the experience that might be applicable in other situations. Pink says, uh, Pink et al. says, uh, digital ethnography can be shaped in relation to the particular research questions, which it asks, as well as to the institutional contexts 
which it is related to, and the ways in which participants and the research engage with it. This invites openness and allows for collaboration. We make knowledge with participants, not about them. It is the co-production of knowledge. And this was the, the message uh, of the video, the lecture, the second part of the lecture, at least, in week four. So you can you know, build up a, a community of collaborators to help you figure out um, how a particular brand is uh, being understood via Instagram or how likely someone is to click on the shop now button on Instagram or a Facebook ad or so on with a, a team of uh, a community of knowledge producers who are not part of your organization, but are part of community who are interested in your organization and doing research with you. Reflexive. This is really important, and this is the, the kind of key thing about ethnography, is the understanding of your own personal experience, your own personal history, your own, your own um, personal culture, your own uh, relationships with people and technologies, and how that frames your interpretation of experience. It is unique to you, but you need to register it and, and make sense of it in order to um, authentically engage in an ethnography. Ethnographic research knowledge is never objective. It is always formed through our own encounters and engagements with other people and things. Ethnographic research is interpretive. So it's not like uh, quantitative data where you've got stats and you've got you know psychographics and so on. You're making informed observations by reflecting on that, that cultural framework and then making recommendations based on your subjective knowledge and experience. Very different type of research. Just as important, but it has its caveats. And one of those is it's not generalizable. It can help you to think about things, right? So when you are studying the, the, way, in, the way in which... Um, uh, the way in which uh, Twitch streamers talk about content online, right? You, that, that can help you figure out and think about the way in which Facebook live streamers are talking about content. But it's not generalizable. It's not one-to-one. -one. You can't say one is happening in, in one place and therefore it's happening in another. You have to evaluate each on their own, but that evaluation can be informed by your experience. So it's super valuable. An orthodox. Digital ethnography is unpredictable and can go beyond traditional written forms of research. And this is where we're talking uh, in this subject about the role of ethnography as content. Podcasts, streamers, uh, Instagram, present, present, presentation of the public self through the, through the, the production of a persona. Um, ethnography is increasingly a content layer in the emergent media paradigm. It often lacks a high degree of reflexivity, but the very nature of the presentation of the public self as content in the online creative industries does include a kind of uh, reflexivity. For example, you know, seeing myself on the screen, right, is, is a very confronting thing. Listening to my voice on a podcast, because it sounds very different to how I sound, is a very confronting thing and it helps us to constantly reevaluate how we are presenting ourselves. The other thing about digital ethnography is that it is unpredictable. And so it is crucial to take as many notes, as many screenshots, and record as much data as you can. This is because your research can go off in a completely different trajectory that you weren't expecting. And so it's important to map that trajectory out through your field site, right? Through your relations. That mapping of the field site, do that every week and come up with a different map or a different pathway through that map as you're collecting your data. Because that will help you then communicate that experience via your DA. If you're doing a, a video essay, for example, or a blog post, those maps um, of, of the kind of process of collecting research will be immensely valuable and useful visual materials to help, um, as I say here, convey emotions, materialities, activities, and the configurations of the research process. Screenshot, 
record video like this. You know, sometimes just have a chat to yourself on your phone about your experience and collect as much of that data as you can because the results are unpredictable.